Oh, you may or may not know this, but once upon a time, Jesus dealt out a pretty serious slam on a guy. Now, when you are sitting in our time and our language, it doesn't sound like that. But when you think of it, uh, in his culture, he really did torch this guy. And this, arguably, is the only time Jesus does this in exactly this way. Now, we're going to look at what that was, but more importantly, why it was. And I'm going to give you two reasons of why it matters to all of us, because it points out something that Jesus really cared about a lot. Uh, my name is Brett Nicholson. I'm the pastor of One Life Church, and we want to provide helpful biblical content for you and your one and only life. So the setup is, Jesus was told that the ruling politician, where he is, wants to kill him. And his name is Herod Antipas. Now, Herod Antipas uh, was one of a few Herods that you encounter in the New Testament and can get kind of confusing. It helps to know which one you're actually talking about. Now, his father is known to history as Herod the Great. Now, he was the one uh, who was around when Jesus was born, and he was the one who had all the babies in Bethlehem uh, killed that were two and under. Now, that Herod would have died when Jesus was about four or five years old. We're not talking about that Herod. Uh, this is one of his sons. But he was the ruler of the place where Jesus spent most of his time, which is Galilee. Now, this Herod's claim to fame was he left his wife for his half-brother's wife. He really did. He went to stay at their house and he ends up picking up his uh, brother's wife and taking her home and makes her his wife. Now, because of this, John the Baptist calls him out. And because of that, Herod puts John into prison and eventually has him killed. Now, this is how all this goes down. So while he's in prison, uh, Herod's new daughter, his new stepdaughter, uh, does this dance uh, for a, him and a bunch of his guests. And he likes it so much that he offers her anything she wants. But her mom pulls her aside and says, hey, ask for the head of John the Baptist which I'm sure the daughter was pretty disappointed because she's probably thinking, man, this is my chance to get a new car, a limitless credit card, or something like that. But she goes ahead and agrees, and she asks for the head of John the Baptist. So Herod has him killed. Well, then Jesus appears on the scene, and he's even more popular than John the Baptist. So at that point, Herod wants to kill Jesus because he actually thinks that Jesus may be John come back from the dead. A little bit of a guilty conscience going on there, right? So some guys pull Jesus aside and they say, listen, Herod wants to kill you. So Jesus' reply is this. He says, go tell that fox. And then basically he says, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to stay on my own schedule. I'm not afraid of you, in other words. But it's that word fox that's really interesting. Now, when we hear that, it sounds like he's giving me a strange sort of compliment, like you sly person, or you clever guy. But it's not that. In their language, in their time, it was a genuine insult. Uh, the way they use the word fox, especially in reference to a uh, political leader, is it's basically saying, you are a worthless punk. Now, one commentator said it this way, uh, if, if you could change the word that we translate fox in English to the word that they would have heard in Greek, there's a lot of different options. You could call him a weakling, small fry, poser, clown, nobody, weasel, or peon, uh, or you take your pick. Uh, my personal favorites were Clown and Weasel. But either way, none of them are good. So why did he call him that? One scholar pointed out that while Jesus says some pretty harsh things to like the Pharisees, it's arguable that this is the only time that Jesus showed someone true contempt. Uh, now later, like for instance, during Jesus' trial, he was put in front of Herod and he doesn't say a word to the guy at all. I mean, he actually had a conversation with Pilate but he says nothing at all to Herod. And the question is why? Why the contempt for Herod? Was it because he killed his cousin, John the Baptist? Maybe. But when you gather up all of the Bible data that we have and all this historical data that we have about Herod, we're, we can understand a lot more about why Jesus slammed this guy. See, Herod was considered by the Jews to not be a real Jew. He had a little bit of Jewish blood, ethnically, but not very much. But he was the ruler of the Jews. But Herod was a politician. And we know from history and archaeology that Herod would perform Jewish ceremonial washings, and uh, uh, he celebrated Jewish festivals. Uh, publicly, he did the things that Jews liked. But on the other hand, he lived in a way that Jews hated. For instance, uh, that whole thing of him leaving his wife and marrying his uh, brother's wife, that's something that Jews would have thought was detestable, something they would have hated. 
That whole thing where he has his daughter dance for strangers, they would have thought that was terrible, especially because it was probably a very sensual dance. And the greatest building project that the guy did in his whole time as a ruler, he built a city called Tiberias, which you can see to this day. But uh, first of all, he named it after the Roman emperor. Jews would have hated that. Second of all, he built the city right on top of a Jewish cemetery. And for many, many years, Jews wouldn't even walk into this town. In other words, he would play a ceremonial religious part uh, to make himself look good for the Jews. But in his real, important, and personal ethical decisions, uh, he wasn't living like a Jew at all. He was a poser. It was all ceremonial and nothing real. Even worse, he was a political poser. Now this is what Jesus shows contempt for, and this is what you and I need to learn from. It teaches us at least two things we ought to be on the lookout for. Number one, politicians today who do the same exact thing exploitation of religion. You think of politicians that are, do the religious symbolic stuff and play to the crowd, but you know uh, they don't really live this stuff in their private lives. Be on your guard. You know, Jesus wasn't naive about this kind of stuff, and he doesn't call us to be naive either. Uh, don't be exploited, don't be manipulated by politicians who play the part. That's number one. Number two, that's the tendency in ourselves to be posers. You know, we should ask ourselves, are we guilty of going through the religious motions but rarely let the things of God into our real and important and personal ethics decisions? Do we do the same thing? It's easy to point at politicians. But Jesus is not a fan of this stuff at all, and we shouldn't be either. Authenticity and integrity should be our goal. And although we walk out this stuff imperfectly, uh, let's be careful not to let church attendance or singing songs or going to Christian events fool us or others into thinking that we're something that we're not. Let's be the real deal. I hope you found some of this helpful, and if you did, uh, if you wouldn't mind hitting the like and the subscribe button, it really helps us get ready for future content. See you next time.